TPM is coming to Linux. What does that mean and are you ready for it? Well, today we're going to consider these factors as we dive into what is TPM, which Linux distributions are starting to use it, should you use it, should you not. Thanks for checking out this video. Again, we're going to be talking about TPM because another distribution is coming out with active TPM support. And we want to talk about what this could mean. And we want to do a deep dive looking at the trusted platform module, which is what TPM stands for. And we're going to talk about the implications, what is really good about it, what is really bad about it, and the types of things that we might want to consider. So in this video, we're going to talk about what is TPM, why is it useful? We're going to talk about why is it harmful and the various Linux distributions that currently support TPM and if you should do that or not. And then we will end up with protecting your Linux distributions from the TPM rollouts and a few bonus Q and A's about some questions that I found doing my basic research. So subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so for more videos about Linux technology and other things related to similar concepts. And we will go ahead and dive right on in. So part one, what is TPM? TPM stands for the Trusted Platform Module. It is a module that sits on the motherboard of the computer and is registered with the BIOS. And what it does is it does some basic security checks. You can think of it as a YubiKey for your computer. Only like this YubiKey, I could like lose this somewhere or whatever else. The trusted platform module chip, the TPM chip on the board, it's not going to get lost. Although a few other things could happen to it. So it is like a YubiKey. It does a, on startup, it will do a series of checks and it works with kind of like in conjunction with secure boot to check if anything changed in the system. Is everything started as usual? Is some weird thing going on? And if any weird thing goes on, it will say, hey, something's going on here and it's not going to uh, uh, decrypt your disk. So in short, to run TPM, you're running your system in a fully encrypted disk. And what it does is it keeps a pass key that you don't have to enter. So this means that the TPM is a push into that leaving the password behind that thing that I think is a bunch of nonsense. And in that light, what we're going to be looking at here is a way to will protect your system in the ideal circumstances. But of course, this leads to some of the downsides. We'll get more of the downsides in later. But suppose just something weird goes wrong in your computer, the thing may not trigger. Now, there's ways around that in certain cases. But again, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So I want to talk first about what is TPM useful for? So why is this a useful platform? Well, it's used first and foremost. It allows you to have a, de a completely encrypted drive that allows you to decrypt it without entering a passkey. Of course, this means it's trying to get us away from passwords, those evil things that are too easy to crack. So let's all rely on proprietary devices. <laughs> I'll keep my pass keys. Thank you. Lux encryption with a complicated password to start my computer is actually my preferred way to go. Not that you can't hook it up with a UB key, and I'm researching a video for that down the road. So we'll talk about that more at a later time. But it is useful because you can have an encrypted drive without the necessity of entering a pass key every time you turn on your computer. It does also use the encrypted pass keys on the system. You can set it up for using with encrypted email, including Thunderbird and Evolution. Both will work with a TPM module in order to read encrypted emails with a pass key tied to that TPM module. So it can simplify the process of securing emails. Again, of course, assuming you're only using a single computer for work. Now, it will prevent tampering with the system. So if somebody comes in and tries to throw on some extra piece of hardware, maybe they slip some USB key in the back somewhere that uh, you think nobody will see, which is going to do a hardware misconfiguration. Maybe it's something that's a key logger of some form or another. The TPM is going to go, eh, something's weird here, and it's not going to trigger. It's going to give you an, a warning that you can look into it. So that is really... It's really good for useful things. 
Now, it does lock the disc to the machine, which can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Obviously, why this is useful is because locking the disc to the machine means that somebody can't steal that disc and then just using an external disc adapter to read the contents because the disc can only be decrypted with a pass key or with the TPM module itself. So it does protect it in that case. There are some downsides to that, which we are going to get into the harmful section, but the last thing it can really do is it will automate your security checks. And these are all good features that it does. It does actually make sense to use TPM in some of these cases because it does provide a form of security. Now, I personally, I would rather tie it to some physical device that I have external, a US, uh, um, a UB key, and if you can attach a couple UB keys to it, that would be even better. Uh, attaching a pass key to it, I like those methodologies better because it means I have a more portable Linux. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about that more in a bit. But I want to talk about why is this harmful? What are the downsides of TPM? So how is this harmful? Well, the first thing that we have found in doing a lot of research is this particularly is applicable to Windows. Since TPM is the standard default turned on and enabled in a lot of your newer Windows systems, most people have TPM enabled by default when they first turn on their system. And there's no prompt to say, hey, you need to set up a pass key that you can get back into this disk should the TPM module fail. And since that's something that most people don't know they have to do, most people don't do it. And so that I'm basically saying that, yes, Windows needs to do one more annoying pop up to say, hey, very important, you have to set a pass key for this disk. So if the TPM module goes bad, you can still decrypt your data. Because if you don't do that, and I've seen a lot of cases where people, they didn't know their system encrypted their disk by default. Most people don't know this because Windows wants to automate everything and it wants to take human responsibility out of everything. And that is a problem because people don't know they have to set a pass key in order to get into the disk, assuming that that all fails. Again, this mostly because they're pushing it to get people away from pass keys in general. And so they wouldn't want to do that because why would we tell somebody that you got to have a pass key? We're trying to get the whole world to think passwords are bad. And that certainly is a problem. So TPM does help erode that ability we have to keep our system secure with good and complicated pass keys that are not tied to pieces of hardware that can be lost can be stolen or simply might go bad. Of course, if your whole disk goes bad, we'll talk more about backup strategies in a bit. But it can prevent migrating the disk to a new computer. Supposing your computer blows up, your power supply goes wonky, fries the whole system, you got to replace everything, but somehow your hard disk survived. If that happens to you, and that disk is still viable, most Linux distributions outside like a Gen 2, which streamlines itself by only installing the drivers needed for that system, most Linux distributions, you can pop that disk out, put it in any other computer, and still boot it and run it without missing a day of work. It's just instantaneous, automated, um, automatically works because of how the kernel works. So it can prevent that type of migration. And if that module dies and you do not have a backup strategy, that one tiny little module on your computer dies, your whole computer is just useless at that point in time. Uh, you'd have to replace the module if you can, if you have a detachable module that you can replace. Otherwise, the whole system is dead. And that is problematic. Now, this could also trigger a lockout. So suppose just your graphics card dies and you just need to swap your graphics card. That could be enough to trigger the TPM module to say something is unusual and will prevent your disk from being decrypted, thus preventing you from getting into your operating system because something like a symbol non-TPM related piece of hardware suddenly died. These are downsides of the TPM module. Now, it's not saying that these are reasons you never use it. It's just there's very useful applications of TPM and there's very dangerous applications of TPM. We have to understand what they are so we can make a logical and informed decision. And so with this, we want to get into part four, Linux and TPM. 
Linux and TPM. Which Linux distributions currently support TPM? Well, Red Hat does have the capabilities of supporting TPM and by extension, Fedora does as well. Starting with Fedora 34 with most of the bugs worked out in Fedora 36. So those are some distributions that have it as an option. Now, none of these distributions so far are forcing TPM on you like Windows 11 is forcing TPM on you but they are available for those that are interesting to make a use of it. Of course, we talked in the news a few months back about uh, Ubuntu, September 7th, a TPM-backed full disk encryption is coming to Ubuntu. I believe we have a full video on this. And basically, it starts with encrypting your disk with Lux, give it a pass key, a passphrase boot at prompt. And this is where Ubuntu is doing it well because you have to start with a password protected Lux encryption and then you are adding access via the TPM module uh, after it's booted. Of course, the downside of the Ubuntu measure is it requires Snap to do it because all of the things that they have for the TPM module are implemented via an application on Snap, trying to get more people forcing themselves over to Snap. And of course, OpenSUSE also, we just covered this in the news this last week. OpenSUSE Leap 16 has been confir uh, confirmed will be released with SUSE's adaptable Linux platform, the ALP. Now, part of the ALP is TPM-based security protocols. Now, I do not know if... TPM is forced on users of OpenSUSE Leap 16 or if it's just an availability. I did not dig deep enough into it just to point out that that is an option that we have. Additionally, Arch does have the means to run a trusted platform module support. They have information about it. Once again, it is starting at data with Lux decryption, which means that you can use it with a pass key. You can also set up Lux with a Yubi key. Again, I am going to be investigating that down the road in the future, but you can do TPM for SSH keys. You can use it for GBG, uh, GPG, excuse me. You can use it for a variety of different things. So if this is something you want to take advantage of in Linux, it is something that you have the capability of doing. And therefore, it actually does make sense for some people to utilize this, particularly in a high security module where you're looking for every possible form of security uh, preventions. It might be a way to go. However, some people consulting some of the, the forums I was reading through in my research on this, some people People say, yeah, I wouldn't use TPM because is it all proprietary? Well, I had didn't dig super deep into it. Is it all proprietary stuff locked with Microsoft keys? Yeah, I'd probably trust something like a YubiKey better than anything else for that outside of a complicated password. So there is your state of Linux and TPM. And next up, we want to talk about protecting Linux and changes to our current strategies. So protecting Linux. As of now, TPM is not forced on Linux users. However, with a lot of corporations investing heavily in Linux production, it is not outside the realm of possibility. We are going to see that coming to a distribution near you. If we were all placing bets, I would put it somewhere either towards the Red Hat end or towards the Ubuntu end first. OpenSUSE has its own weird issues, but there's a lot more big tech tie-ins to Fedora and Red Hat because of their connection to IBM, although Ubuntu is doing everything it can possibly do to make itself look and play like the big guys in the playground like Microsoft and Apple. So it wouldn't surprise me if either Red Hat or uh, Ubuntu goes with a forced TPM module in the near future, although as of right now, they are not doing that. So that does mean that we have options. We can utilize the TPM chip on our modern computers should we want to. But we have to keep this in mind. One of the great things about Linux has always been its portability. 
See, I have a little completely encrypted USB drive that runs all of my banking stuff. None of my banking stuff goes on any computer except that one. Good way of isolating things and then nothing gets done on that computer except banking stuff. So we minimize the chance of malware getting spread or things like that. Well, that little drive can be plugged into any computer I have. It's encrypted. I enter a pass key on boot up and I can get in and do my banking stuff on that. With TPM enabled on a Linux distribution, you lose that portability. You lose the ability to pull the disk out of the computer if the computer goes defunct and plugging it into any other drive, you lose that basic ability. So we do use uh, lose the loss of uh, portability inside of Linux. And so that is certainly one of the things to keep in mind. If you rely on your Linux systems being portable in that way, that is something that you will want to consider. Obviously, something like Tails is probably never going to have TPM enabled because by its nature, it's designed to be portable. So the other factors we have to keep in mind is the first, as we've already mentioned, pass keys. If you are using any form of TPM, if you're on Windows right now and you have Windows 11, which is TPM enabled, and it crosses your mind, I do not know how to get into my disk if that is done. Investigate that today and set up pass keys because if your module goes bad or something else on the computer goes bad that the TPM chip does not let you on the disk, you need those backup passwords to get into your Windows disk. That's the only way you're going to have to get your data back. So make sure you do that. That same thing goes on Linux. If you are using TPM, make sure you have a good record of those pass keys. I would just use something like a keypass XC file on an external encrypted drive. So you have an encrypted USB drive with an encrypted pass key file that can be read on any computer that you have and put the pass keys for your disk inside of that. Very, very secure and which case will keep you protected. Next, since more systems are pushing TPM modules. Make sure you have a better backup strategy because you do have a greater loss of a system, some greater component of the computer going bad. The TPM will fail to boot, and in a result, you could lose your data. We have a greater chance of data loss on a TPM-enabled system. Now, that is a positive in that security is better handled in that circumstance. However, you don't want to lose your data, so make certain that you have a good backup strategy that makes sense with the amount of data that you generate. If you're not doing a lot of excess important stuff, hey, once a month is probably good. If you're doing a lot of high-end work, some weekly, daily backups will save you a lot of headaches. So those are some of those things that you want to keep in mind. Bonus, in my research, I kept coming across two basic questions. One related to Secure Boot and the other, obviously, TPM, talking about the activation of such components. So question number one, do I have to disable Secure Boot? If you go back even the earlier videos on this channel, we did talk a lot about disabling Secure Boot because Linux distributions typically did not work with Secure Boot. It's just a way of verifying that the OS that is asking to boot itself is actually signed with some form of signing key that is valid. And so for a long time, our tips always went into the BIOS, disable secure boot, boot your system. Right now, you don't have to do that on a lot of distributions. Many Linux distributions out of the box support secure boot. So you can install and enable secure boot on your modern systems without having to worry about secure boot. Now, if you do have issues booting, disable secure boot and see if that solves your problem. Now, regarding the TPM chip, does the TPM chip have to be disabled if you are going to be installing Linux? The answer is no. There are three states. There are completely disabled chips. There are um, enabled but not activated TPM state, and there is an activated TPM state. The TPM state is really only going to trigger for a disk that calls for it. So some component in the computer has to call for something in that TPM module to trigger it. And so if even if it's activated, the disk may call for something. Uh, basically, the, the, the TPM module has a readout screen. You might see an error on your booting screen that just talks about inability to communicate or error with the TPM chip. But if you've never set the TPM chip up to run with your distribution, it doesn't matter. That error is inconsequential. You can disable it if you want to, if you're not planning on using it. If you are planning on using it, obviously keep it 
uh, enabled and activate it with your system, but you do not have to disable TPM in order to install Linux. So hopefully that cleared up a lot of the questions you might have about TPM and Linux. And with that, subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. Hit that like button and leave us a comment down there that helps the video along in the algorithm. You can have a look at some of the other videos that we have. I'll go ahead and put a video about switching to Linux uh, on the end screen on the YouTube channel. And of course, if you are watching this on our Odyssey, our Rumble, or our BitChute page, yeah, find another video for us if you are interested in more Linux-type content. With that, thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.